Ladies and gentlemen, welcome on behalf of the Theosophical Society headquarters in London, England. A quick disclaimer for all of our talks, please note that the views of our speakers and their presentations are not necessarily the view of the society. We will have a few minutes at the end of our talk tonight and you are welcome to ask questions if you wish. Please leave a message in the chat and we will call on you and you can open your mic and your video or I am happy to ask Gary on your behalf. Gary Lockman is a prolific author of many books on esoteric philosophy, metaphysics, consciousness, and much more. Um, he's uh, written Madame Blavatsky, The Mother of Modern Spirituality, The Secret Te Teachers of the Western World, The Lost Knowledge of the Imagination, and tonight we enter part three of our three-part series on, a talks, on talks based on his work, A Secret History of Consciousness. You might remember Gary as Gary Valentine, the velvety bass player for the legendary rock group Blondie. Before he moved to London in 1996 and becoming a full-time writer, Gary studied philosophy. He managed a metaphysical bookshop. He taught English literature and was a science writer for the University of Southern, uh, University uh, UCLA, <laughs> University of Los Angeles. He's an adjunct professor of transformative studies at the universe at the California Institute of Integral Studies. And we are grateful to have him with us tonight for the final episode of our three-part series. Please welcome the one and only Gary Lockman and the presence of origin. Thank you, right. Gary. Welcome, welcome. Well, my pleasure. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me get the uh, light show running as it were here. And uh, from the beginning, is that working or where are we? Yeah, you're good. Oh, no. Slideshow from the beginning. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. Yes, this is part three of this series of talks. Um, the other two are up online if, if you've missed those. Uh, but I imagine if you saw the first one, you were riveted by it and you, you made sure that you had uh, front row seats for the other two. Tonight, we're going to be talking about um, someone that I, I suspect he's not as well known. Well, I know he's not as well known as he should be, and I don't think he's that well known within what we might call the alternative kind of world, alternative philosophies and things of that sort. Uh, it's this gentleman here, Gene Gepser, and um, he's, we'll get on to some people that have, have um, written about him and, and talked about him, and in contemporary terms, whose work uh, he's influenced. I've write about him in Secret History of Consciousness. There's a, quite, a, quite an extended section on him in there. And I do that precisely because of what I just said, that um, he isn't as well known as he should be. And I do uh, more recently, um, I write about him in uh, Secret Teachers of the Western World. Where in that book, I look at the um, history of Western esotericism, the, all the, the, the counter tradition, uh, the shadow tradition of, of the Western sort of intellectual, um, um, you know, tradition, uh, in through the lens of um, Gebser's uh, work, which we'll be talking about uh, this evening, and also through that of um, the work of Ian McGilchrist in his book *Master Emissary*. Um, there's quite a few things where they overlap um, in terms of, say, uh, well. We'll, we'll get onto that uh, uh, later on, perhaps. And uh, I use his ideas and those two to understand the sort of the history of the Western esoteric tradition. And um, what I'm going to do this evening is just introduce you to Gene Gebser's work and who he is and why he, he is important. And I'll try to do that with enough time uh, for everyone to go and uh, watch the football match later on this evening. So I mentioned there's some um, rather influential uh, readers of Gebser in the mind, body, spirit uh, realm. Uh, one is Ken Wilber. He's probably the one who is, um, well, I'm gonna say most well-known, but uh, that's not really true. But um, whose ideas have spread rather uh, uh, wide in uh, aspects of the sort of mind, body, alternative kind of culture. And he talks about Gebser's uh, ideas about structures of consciousness, which we'll get on to in quite a few of his books. Uh, this fellow here, uh, Georg Feuerstein, he's probably not as well known as Wilbur, um, but um, he wrote many books on yoga and Hinduism, but he wrote a very, very good introductory book to Gebser's work called Structures of Consciousness. Uh, I'll get to a, um, a 
a slide of that <clears throat> down the line. And, and if you ever come across it uh, and you're interested in Gebster, I would just grab it. I, I think it goes for outrageous prices on, on the internet. But if you ever by chance see it in a used bookshop, if you ever by chance find a used bookshop anymore, uh, I would certainly grab it. It's very readable and it, it gives a very good introduction to um, Gebster's ideas. I mean, I, I plundered it shamelessly uh, for the chapters I, I, I write. Uh, Gebser in, in my book. And over here is uh, William Irwin Thompson, who um, passed away just a, a year or two ago, I think, or um, relatively recently. And um, he, in the 80s and 90s, I think up until the 2000s, or even in, in the late 70s, he was very well known. He was involved with the Lindisfarne Foundation and uh, wrote quite a few books about, um, again, the alternative culture. Uh, there's one called Pacific Shift and the Time Falling Bodies take to light and a variety of others. And like Gebster, he was in, interested in the idea of a kind of evolution of, of consciousness. And um, like Gebster, he was charting that kind of culturally, which is what Gebster does. Uh, he doesn't talk about consciousness so much and say, what is it, what's it made of, or and it, it's not about quantum and that kind of thing. It's a cultural kind of um, way of looking how through different shifts in culture, there we, we can we can see uh, changes in consciousness, and so um, Gebser was born in 1905 in um, a place called Posen, which at the time was in Prussia, um, which was Germany, but it was um, I, 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 it might be part of Poland now. I'm not exactly sure where it is, but it's up the north, up the, up uh, towards uh, that end of it. And um, 1905 was an interesting year. Quite a few things were happening around then. Um, it was only a few years earlier that Freud's book, The Interpretation of Dreams, came out. Uh, Einstein's revolutionary theories about um, relativity and, and so on were uh, emerging at this time as well. Uh, Edmund Husserl, who was the founder of a philosophical school known as phenomenology, out of which existentialism and Sartre and, and Camus and all of that emerged later on. So all that was happening around the time when Gebser was born. And um, I have this heading here, Primal Trust. And I have this, I think this is a Norman Rockwell. I'm not quite sure, either that or it's a very, very hyper-realistic kind of painting. Um, but it's this notion that in German, um, Gebser coined this term, Urvertrauen. So it's a primal trust. It's a kind of faith in, in life or a kind of inner confidence that things will work out, <laughs> you know, take the risk. And um, he tells a story when he was relatively young, I guess about 10 or maybe a little bit earlier, when um, he had to uh, dive from the high dive. And um, he just decided, OK, you know, Geronimo, I'm, I'm going to take my chances. But I'm, I, uh, I have this kind of I mean, he wasn't you know, saying these words to himself when he was that young, but he basically had this kind of inner confidence. And it was sort of, you know, take take the leap, take the leap into the unknown, take the risk. And so he did that. And that was something that he'd be doing pretty much uh, for most of his life, certainly for the, the first half of it. And <clears throat> I said he was born in 1905, uh, you know, uh, by 10 years later, uh, Europe was in flames. World War I had broken out. Um, so, um, again, <laughs> the notion of having some kind of inner confidence in an uncertain world where you're not quite sure what's going to work out or what you can trust and when you can't, it was put to uh, quite a test, um, you know, more than having to jump off the high dive. And then following um, World War I, uh, the Great Depression that hit um, Germany and the Weimar Republic, his parents, who were fairly well off, um, were hit by that and they lost all their savings and, um, you know, were made destitute and, and so on, as were millions of others uh, at the time. And also at the same time, this created the sort of seedbed for the rise of uh, Hitler and National Socialismus and, um, you know, preying on the anxieties of people at the time and the failure of the Weimar Democratic Republic uh, to uh, do anything, you know, post-World post War I to um, revitalize Germany. And so Gebser saw um, this happening around him. And uh, he kind of had firsthand experience of seeing sort of the Nazi rallies in Munich and, and places like that. In his personal life, um, he was quite close to his father, who uh, 
had a lot of intellectual interests and loved literature and things of that sort. And um, not so as close to his mother, who, who was younger than his father, and was not quite as interested in, in the kind of aesthetic or cultural world as he was. And um, when his father died, um, he was taken out of school, and his mother uh, said that he had to start work as an apprentice in, in a bank. That was his family, uh, his background was in the banking world. And um, he didn't want to, but he dutifully did. And then um, after about two years of apprenticeship, he just decided that he couldn't do it anymore. And uh, he left that and he went into collaboration or a partnership with the friend of his to try and launch a literary magazine. And so he's throwing himself into these uncertain <laughs> kind of waters uh, all the time. And not only did he you know, quit the bank, um, within two years, the magazine folded and um, national socialism had become a, a very, very potent force. And um, Gibson thought, you know, it was time to go. So he hightailed it down to Spain. Um, maybe not the best choice at the time, but he um, became very interested and through correspondence got to know and then met while he was there, the poet Frederico Garcia Lorca. Um, they worked together on several uh, projects there. Um, Gibson didn't know any Spanish and he learned it while he was there. And this was um, a sort of evidence of his linguistic abilities. But um, <clears throat> pretty much the same thing that was happening in Germany started to happen in Spain as well with the rise of Franco, uh, the, the nationalists insurgents against the you know, uh, duly elected uh, the government. And um, Gebser had to leave Spain as well. But he, he not until um, he had the inspiration for his magnum opus, which he called this lightning-like, the lightning strike-like inspiration that came to him uh, in Spain. And it had to do with reading the poetry of um, Rainer Maria Rilke over here. And um, what Gemser felt or what he believed that he could see in Rilke's poetry was um, precisely this kind of shift in consciousness. And this happened in about 1932. And it wasn't until the, say the forties that uh, he began to actually write the book, but he wrote other books before then, uh, his major work, The Ever-Present Origin, which is this uh, remarkable work that we'll get onto, uh, but just touch the surface, surface of in, in a bit. But it was through reading Rilke's poetry that, um, he had this, this kind of experience of, of recognizing that a shift was going on in consciousness in, in the West. Um, not to say that he was ignorant of you know, other cultures. And in fact, he later on in his career went out of his way to become familiar with Eastern and so on and, and, and visited India and had a mystical experience there. But um, while he was in Spain, Franco's forces came into power and uh, Rilke had to leave Spain again. He left just a few hours, he left a few hours before his, his flat, his apartment in Madrid was bombed. So had he not left, he most likely would have been killed there. And he was almost um, arrested and, uh, well, he was stopped at the border and he was almost executed at the border, but he had some friends um, in high places that enabled you know, um, him to pass, but this didn't uh, work out for Lorca, who was assassinated by um, Franco's, Franco's men. Where did, um, where did um, Gebser go? He went to Paris here. And again, this is some place he's gonna to have to leave very, very soon too. But it was like that then at that time um, in Europe. And um, there he, because of his association with Lorca and a variety of other things, he got to know artists like uh, Picasso and writers like uh, Andre Marot um, and others at the time. And this was this strange twilight world in Paris where um, it wasn't, hadn't been, it wasn't occupied yet, but the, the phony war was over and the French um, had capitulated. So you had, um, you know, this, you had the Vichy, Vichy France and, and uh, well, sort of free France. And um, Gebser was once again in this environment where um, he had to, you know, hit the road very soon. So he left Paris just a few hours before the borders uh, between France and Switzerland were closed. And like so many others, um, he got to Switzerland. Now, it was in 
Switzerland that um, he finally found a kind of you know resting place, found some place where he could work peacefully at unpacking this inspiration that came to him um, in Spain from reading Rilke's poetry about this shift in consciousness. And fundamentally, the shift was about our experience of time or our relation to time. And we, again, we'll get onto that further down. But this, this was the sort of essence of what, Will, uh, what Gebser believed he saw in this, this lightning flash in, in reading Gilka's poetry, that in, in the West, it's ideas about time, it's notion about time um, were, were shifting. And he started to find evidence for that in other places as well. And he got to know Jung, and he uh, lectured at uh, university there in Zurich. He was also um, a very uh, familiar figure at the Eranos lectures that uh, Jung presided, presided over at this wonderful uh, place, uh, Ascona, in Switzerland, in the, um, well, it's called Ticino, or Tessin, if you're uh, the German area of Switzerland. It's kind of has its own strange sort of Mediterranean microclimate. If you know Hermann Hesse, um, uh, who was around at the same time, he lived in an area of Ticino, it wasn't Ascona, it's uh, not far over. Uh, Ascona is near Locarno and Lugano, which is the bigger, city there. It's a big sort of gambling kind of resort. Uh, Hesse lived in a place called Montagnola, which was near there. Uh, but it's, I mean, it's rather built up now, but in those days, say in the 19, <clears throat> well, 1920s, this, this would be in the uh, uh, early 40s. Um, it was still relatively kind of, you know, idyllic. Um, and if you ever, if you ever pass through there, it's a fantastic um, area. So you wouldn't think you're in Switzerland, uh, put it that way. And um, on the shores of um, um, Lago Maggiore, you, there's this place called Casa Gabriella. And this is where the Arenos lecture uh, conferences were held every year. Uh, Jung, Maciej Eliade, Gershom Scholem, and then in later years, people like um, Joseph Campbell and um, James Hillman. And I mean, they, they went on for quite some time. I don't know if they're going on anymore. Um, I know, I think the, in, the, by, in the late 90s and the early 2000s, they were still going on. I actually visited there um, one time, and I guess it must have been about 2008 or something like that, when I was working on my book about Jung. And I was shown around um, uh, by uh, Richard Tarnas, who wrote this wonderful book called The Passion of the Western Mind. And uh, there wasn't anything going on at the time, which in many ways was good because I got to see sort of the guided tour. And it's like, oh, this is, this is where Jung used to sit at, in, in the, after, the after conference. So over in this sort of corner, uh, and, you know, fantastic view, you know, in, incredibly um, beautiful, uh, idyllic kind of, kind of place. And uh, so Gebser, you know, finally found uh, a home. And I mentioned earlier his interest in, in Eastern um, kind of cultures. Um, he did. He, he wrote a book in the early 60s called um, Asia Smiles Differently. Sadly, not much of his work, aside from the magnum opus, The Ever-Present Origin, uh, is translated in, into English. Um, I, I've been in touch with some people who are doing some translations of the poetry and things of that sort. Mm, there's only a couple books written about him in English. Um, I know there's uh, one online, but I don't know if there's like a full-on biography available in English. Um, it, it's a shame because um, it, it certainly would um, find a readership, I think, if it was out there. Uh, but in any case, he talks about how he has this sort of mystical experience when he's in Sarna, which is an important city in the history of Buddhism. And um, he talks about it as being his Satori experience. And it was uh, something that shift shifted him, but it was also something that he didn't, um, <clears throat> he, he didn't talk about until um, his final years. He, he talked about it to Georg Feuerstein, who I mentioned earlier. And uh, this is not until about 1971. He died in, excuse me, he died in 73, so it was just a couple of years before he died. And for some reason, he didn't want 
it, it to be known too much. It may have been the same reason why Jung played his occult cards, his esoteric cards, rather close to his chest for a great deal of his um, life um, until he was in his late sixties, and he had um, that out of the body experience when he was in hospital. Um, so maybe in, in, in the sense that you know he wanted to be considered a you know um, a serious scientist and psychologist, and Gebser, I, I guess, also didn't want the kind of taint at the time that admitting to a mystical experience would have been, you know, uh, would have accompanied that admission um, in the academic world. In any case, it was a, a transformative and um, special moment for him. And he said, after Sarnath, everything is in the right place somehow. So I've talked about this book, The Ever-Present Origin. And I've talked about this notion of uh, structures of consciousness. This is um, the product of this lightning flash, you know, like uh, inspiration that Gebser had uh, reading um, Wilke's poetry. And what he did was unpack, unpack this. I, I said it was about this notion of time or ideas, of, not, not, not our ideas, our felt experience of the ideas would come. You know, it wasn't like, oh, here's some ideas about time or we're all going to change. It's sort of the other way around. There's a kind of felt change about it. And then we develop these ideas to try and articulate what this is. Um, you know, it's, um, and then those ideas, if they're articulated clearly enough, and if enough people read them can help, you know, well, disseminate it in that, in that way. And so it's a kind of dialectical kind of process. Um, and and I, I love this photo of him. I mean, he's, he's quite, quite, a, quite a handsome uh, chap there. Uh, and he's also smoking quite a bit, which if you know about him, he had asthma. So you wonder why he was smoking. I, I guess in our more health conscious days, we ask these kind of questions. Um, but um, ever present origin, he, this lightning like flash comes to him, inspiration 1932. The book isn't published until 1949, the first part, that's in German. And the second part comes out in 52 in German. It's not translated into English until the mid 80s, 1984, by these um, gentlemen here. And um, this was the book I mentioned earlier, Georg Feuerstein, Structures of Consciousness. It's, 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 it's a very good layman's, you know, very readable, you know, way of trying to get a hold of this. Because one of the, um, I mean, it's an enormous book. It's one of these gigantic kind of, you know, uh, six or six something, 600 something pages books. And it covers, you know, basically the whole history or prehistory even of mankind and into you know a possible future and then a variety of different um topics that fall under that you know the rise of science or architecture and all these kinds of things and so all these variety of different sorts of things art religion philosophy sociology all of these things in them he finds expressions and examples of this change in consciousness coming on and here's a, a very very <laughs> thin thumbnail uh, sketch of what he's talking about the book is called the ever-present origin now what is that well origin is this kind of atemporal aspatial you know non-manifest source out of which everything comes. And it's not a source in the sense, say like sequence that it happened there and you know goes down like page one of the book or some historical event that you can pin down to a certain time and place. That's, that's its ever present character. That, that source, that origin is constantly present. It's there. Um, it's, it's the source and it's the goal at, at the same time. The, uh, the Viennese um, sort of satirist and, and, and critic Karl Krauss said, origin is the goal. And that's something that um, Gebser would say as well. And you can find it in, in a similar kind of formulae in, 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 different, in different people. Goethe, you know, he talks about that. It's this notion of it, there's a difference between being original and being novel. You know, original doesn't necessarily mean being new in that flashy, never done before. Um, cutting edge kind of thing. Uh, something is origin is original if it reaches down to the origins, if 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 it, if it reaches down to the roots of things. 
Um, and novelty is something that's very different. It's something, ooh, this hasn't been done before. Well, you know, you can just put things together and ooh, and that sort of thing. But in Gebser's philosophy, put it uh, simply, you, you have this, what he calls ever present origin, and it's something that out of which all these structures of consciousness emerge. Um, he doesn't talk about evolution. Uh, because he thinks terms like evolution, progress, uh, a kind of sequential movement, you know, towards a kind of goal are all aspects of what he calls the mental rational consciousness structure, which we're in, but we're in its kind of last phases for him. We'll get on to that. But um, if you want to think about things like in Buddhism is the sunyata, you know, uh, it's this kind of non-manifest realm. It's a kind of, uh, you know, a, a kind of present nothingness, or a, the pleroma in Gnosticism, or the Ain Sof in Kabbalah, or the Neti Neti in Hinduism. I mean, many, you know, pretty much. I mean, we all posit something like this, you know, even in, in the West. You know, it was the unmoved mover uh, in Aristotle, or just God. There's something that okay. If the buck stops there, you know, it's, you can't you can't get any you can't get behind that anymore, you know. So that's it, and you can't really say much about it because it's not everything else, you know. That's why the, the Hindus say neti neti, not this, not that. So this non-manifest source isn't like anything we could possibly say about it, and even saying that breaks the rules. Uh, so that's why we can't really say too much about it. The first structure to emerge was like an unfolding kind of growth of, you know, like a flower you know, is the archaic. And this is not, apt. it's an identity. He says identity. It's, you know, it's, it's the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest sliver of a micrometer of, you know, difference between origin itself and something that's emerged from it. Um, and, um, but, you know, it's not, it's, Close enough. It's close. To, you can't. There's not much you can say about it, um, and we'll do what we can uh, a little bit further on. After that's the magical structure, consciousness, and this is slightly more separate from origin. Still immersed in a kind of group consciousness. Um, there's no, nothing like an individual self. Nothing like a, a me or you. Uh, you know that can retreat into our minds and think about something. And uh, we have an ego, we have an I that is us, and we're the only one who can say I in that way and mean, mean ourselves. There's nothing like that then. It's much more of a kind of, um, say, like a kind of group mind, and we'll show some modern examples of that. The mythic, which is uh, the beginning of a greater separation from origin. Uh, you, you do have a kind of independent self-consciousness. It's in a participatory relationship and if you've um, attended any some of the other talks i've given for the philosophical society I've, I've my book the lost knowledge of imagination i, I talk about um what the philosopher of language and um uh, anthroposophist uh owen barfield talks about participation that if you look at the history of language the earlier forms of language the way the world is presented in it, it seems like a much more living kind of world. It's a world in which um, uh, there's a kind of flow between um, the human and, and you know, the, the inner and the outer, which is not the case today. You know, we see very, a very sharp distinction between the outer world and the inner world. And in the mythic, you get the beginning of a kind of polar relationship. And um, again, we'll get on to it, but Gebser uses, he, he, he points to the, the myth of Narcissus, where this, the beautiful youth Narcissus falls in love with his uh, reflection in a pool of water. And this is why the, the outer world, the natural world is reflecting this, this growing kind of inner consciousness. And so you have this polarity um, and um, it, it's uh, the age of myth and poetry and things of that sort. But then you have this um, break, this wrenching out of human consciousness from the great surround, you know, from the, uh, the one, whatever you want to call it, origin, we completely split in what he calls the mental rational. And um, that's where we are now, but we're at the tail end of it. 
according to Gebser. We're, we're in what it's called, it's deficient mode. I mean, all these structures, they start out um, very vital and, you know, alive, let's say, and um, they grow, but they reach a certain limit when they've kind of exhausted the possibilities. And what we can say that what was an asset in an earlier time, it was a credit becomes a deficit. And so uh, it, Gebser is saying about our own time, the beginning of say, sort of rational, independent, you know, consciousness able to ask questions and, you know, the rise of, you know, what later we know of science and all that sort of thing. Initially, this was something that was um, a positive development. Um, you, don't, you don't have individual egos. You don't have individual selves um, in these earlier times. Um, and p- other people will uh, say similar things. Steiner says something like this as well. Um, in fact, is in, if you, you ever do look at um, the book Secret History of Consciousness, um, I draw some parallels between if you read the last lecture, the Steiner's sort of epochs and how we describe it. We'll, we'll get on to that as well. So um, there's a sense in which it was necessary for the evolution of consciousness to push us out of that kind of more uh, pleasant and 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 you know harmonious kind of union with everything, but in order to develop our independent uh, consciousness. And according to Gebser, uh, as this breaks down, each of these things break down in order to you know allow space for the the next one to emerge. And it, it's not a picnic. It's not it's not a nice easy kind of transition. It's usually you know wrecks whatever's in place at the time, <laughs> making the change. Um, but what he's saying is that he posits a, a, a fifth structure that he calls the integral. And it, it integrates the previous four um, in, into a whole. And all these structures remain active in us. Uh, they're still part of our, well, a part of our physiology, he'll say, but they're also you know, part of our consciousness. But because we're living in, in the dominant mental rational, um, we're not as aware of them, they're obscured. Much in the same way that, you know, our um, waking consciousness is uh, so prominent and dominant that we don't, you know, we're not really aware most of the time of the kind of continual little line of fantasy that goes on a lot, or, you know, a, a different analogy, like the, the light of the sun obscures the stars. We know the stars are there. They don't go away and then come out at night. It's just that the light from the sun um, diminishes and we can see their light. So uh, there's no guarantee that this will happen, but, but um, this was the shift that Gebser thought, uh, he believed that he saw in Wilker's poetry. Um, and it had to do with this change in our appreciation of time. So let's have a kind of quick run through uh, of uh, these different structures and what they might were like for him. And one of the things too, is that um, you might be thinking, okay, when exactly was this, was this, when exactly were these kind of changes? And Gebser is a bit, it's a bit iffy on, on the dates. Um, you know, some things are so far back in, in time into prehistory that, you know, you can't really prove it. Um, so it's, it's, he, as should we say it? He, he brings an intuitive kind of grasp of many, many, uh, bits of different evidence for these different periods. And uh, they suggest to him that something along these lines, let's say, was taking place. But if we're at the archaic, I mean, this, this, is, this is the nice, nice picture of, you know, what it was like back in the garden when, you know, we all got along with the animals and all that kind of thing. And um, until, you know, we, uh, we had the apple and woke up and started to ask questions and wonder about everything. But it's probably more along the lines of that, um, at least in terms of, um, you know, what the evidence from, you know, what we can tell from um, anthropology. And this is all pre-sapien. This is like, you know, you know, uh, I forget, uh, Af- uh, you know, Homo Africanus and Australopithecus and all of the pre-Sapien kind of ages and ages and ages of, of you know, uh, what would eventually lead to something like um, human uh, emerging. But this is a time, the archaic, when we're just, there's um, hardly any kind of glimmer of, of any kind of flicker of, of nothing like a self. It's, um, as I said, he said, it's a more or less an identity with origin itself and um yeah it's group 
still animal kind of level. I mean, animals seem to have animals seem to be embedded in the world in a way that we're not. Um, but we can kind of step back from things. This is why uh, the, the German philosopher and phenomenologist Max Scheller he said that animals always say yes to existence, even even if they're suffering, even if they're in pain, because they they somehow don't have this ability to step back and reflect and you know on their experience. So we can say that you know any anything remotely linked to you know what turned out to be us was something much more along these kinds of lines and things get slightly you know a little more um more to say about them uh in the next structure which gets to calls the magical structure of consciousness this is still a kind of group mind um it's still not much like anything we would experience in ourself, we, we we do experience these sort of remnants or vestiges of, of these structures. Uh, as I said, Gebser says they don't disappear; they they're still within us. Uh, and when our mental, waking, rational consciousness is dimmed or um, you know distracted, let's say uh, these other structures you know come rise to the surface, and the magical structure of consciousness. Gebser relates to a kind of visceral, as it really has to do with the viscera, with the body. And um, I, I, have, I have two <laughs> things on either side of that. One is the, uh, the, what is it, the 2003 Don't Start the War march, the Million Man March uh, uh, through London. And uh, this gentleman over here, you might recognize Aleister Crowley, um, you know, the, probably the most notorious magician of the 20th century. And it's interesting that. Um, Something Crowley says, and there's another uh, occult writer and magician says the same things. He says the best magic happens unconsciously. Um, it's um, you don't really know how you did it. It happened, but you can't. You couldn't tell. It's just like making a very good shot at pool or billiards or, or something like that. You just you make this incredible shot, and you can't tell anyone, you know, how to do it. But you, you somehow did it. And more times than not, it just happened unconsciously. And, and Crowley says the best magic is that's when it happens. And uh, he had a variety of techniques for throwing himself into these kinds of states of magical unconsciousness where, you know, sometimes something happened, not all the time, but sometimes something happened. And um, Gebser also relates Jung's synchronicities to this level too. And he says it's at a level where um, the group, Mind, it's almost like a group body because um, there's not much of a mind uh, around, you know, uh, in a sense, in the sense of an individual thinking about something. But there's this kind of what he calls this vegetative interconnection or intertwining between all things. And at this, this kind of level, when you have a lot of people and a lot of energy and this kind of whatever you want to call it, life force, vital energy, prana, it's moving, chi, it's moving through the crowd. And this is something where, I mean, I, I actually experienced something like this. And so I was at this, it's not that picture, but I was at this march. And I remember, <clears throat> where was I? I was sort of um, kind of maybe passing through Leicester Square or, or down Shaftesbury Avenue or something like that. And I remember looking behind and people were doing the wave, you know, we were doing this kind of thing. And I saw it happening, you know, I don't know, a, a street or two, whatever, behind. And I said, okay, when it gets here, I'm not going to do it. I'm and not, not that I was anti, I just want to say, I'm, I want, I want to resist, you know, this, this group um, mind kind of thing, but my body had, didn't care a thing. What I thought I could feel this thing coming into me and I could actually feel my arms starting to kind of go up. And it even scared me a bit because I thought, whoa, you know, I, and it wasn't like I forgot, you know, in a way, I mean, I, maybe you could say, oh, I just forgot that I decided to do that, but it was just sort of like, I wasn't even thinking, okay, here it comes. And you could even, you say the wave, you could even, you know, it is like standing um, in the ocean at the shore and you feel the wave coming, like, you know, and you, you, you brace yourself against it. And it was very much like that. So um, Gebser is, um, how should we say it? He's critical or he's sensitive to this, um, anything having to do with this kind of group mind sort of thing. 
precisely because his experiences of the group mind were the were the Nazi rallies or you know the the proto Nazi. Well, it was the Nazis, but you know in the late twenties before they got in, into power, and he saw them marching through the streets with the you know the torches and and the you know the the it's the mythic and the magical happening there. I mean, think just think of it. It's, Many, many people got the torches, got the svatstika, and they're just marching through. And, you know, this is a kind of vitality. Whatever you think about them, you know, they did, they did, they did generate this kind of thing. And later, obviously, when they got into power, they had all the, you know, the enormous rallies. Our, our equivalent, or at least in my generation, this is the rock concert. I guess it's raves, or I don't know, whatever they call them these days, or, or the big dance clubs where you have all the light shows and you have the, you know, pulsing you know, boom, 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 repetitious sort of dance music going on. And uh, you give up your individual identity and you're carried in the buoyant waters of the great, you know, body around you. And it's a wonderful feeling. We like that. People are going to be feeling that this evening, um, you know, at this match, you know. Like, and so, yeah, I mean, they're there, the, the evidence for it um, on, on television. So that's the magical structure. And Gebser says, he talks about, you know, if you're on a train, uh, a train journey and, and the, you know, the repetitious kinds of sound and the kind of monotony that can just put us, you know, a rational sort of mind asleep. We, we, we say we're bored or something, we're looking out the window. And But we get into something that you say would be close to or at least a kind of state that would be open, open to this kind of influence and that sort of thing. So again, um, these structures are active within us all the time. Um, you get to the mythic structure. He can get, Gibson sort of says this, he's saying this is, say starts, you know, at the end of the last ice age or something like that. So that would be, I don't know, 10,000 BC or something around those lines or something. But um, it, it, it's more, again, the, um, the kind of phenomenology of it than getting the actual dates down. So this is a rise where you start to have this kind of reflective consciousness. And here's Narcissus you know, looking in the pool and thinking, hey, I'm, you know, I'm, 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 I'm pretty hot. And you know, he you know, starts to see himself. So human consciousness starts to see itself in the outer world. Before it didn't, it was, it was like fish in water. The, the fish do not know water. You know, they don't know it because it's like they're in it all the time. They're never outside of it to look at. So, oh, what's that? So in the ma archaic and the magical, it was like that. With the mythic, we start to pull away and start to see ourselves as reflection. And they have, you have the great polarities, yin and yang, uh, start happening uh, around then. Um, and even just, you know, earth and sky um deities based on those kind of polarities so you didn't have that separation you didn't have that differentiation before uh you start to have a, a, a pulling away of consciousness from being embedded in in our in origin in the great surround and for the first time actually looking around and <laughs> recognizing something and recognizing there's a difference between me and that there's still a connection it, it isn't it, it, the connection will be severed soon enough, but there's still a connection. And uh, I have, I mentioned Steiner already that his kind of epochs, um, he talks about different epochs of, of consciousness and evolution and evolution of the planet and the cosmos. Uh, they all go together. Um, he talked about, he had very unwieldy terminology, I think, but he talked about what he called old moon consciousness. And this was the sort of consciousness that uh, preceded our waking rational kind of consciousness, what Gebser could call the mental rational. And in this area, sort of the timing and uh, as you can say, uh, or the dates in a certain way, uh, kind of line up. Um, and um, what Steiner said was this old moon consciousness was, it was more of a pictorial kind of consciousness, more image-based. Um, this Owen Barfield, I mentioned earlier about history of language. It was, he's saying the earliest language is much more metaphoric and figurative, which is pictorial and image-based than our, our contemporary language because uh, consciousness was something along the lines of how both Steiner and Gebser, he doesn't refer to them. Uh, Barfield later became um, 
an anthroposophist and a follower of Steiner, but when he was first working on his study of the history of language, he, he, he wasn't aware of it. So he came independently to something very similar. And um, this fellow over here, Eric Heller, has uh, nothing to do with any, any of these fellows, but um, he too wrote about um, history of language or earlier. Uh, it's more in terms of literature, but he was saying that uh, he wrote a very interesting book called The Age of Prose. Was, um, he too saw, as, as Barfield did, that we seem to have moved from the way of looking at the world was more poetic, the age of the myths, the age in which people could still speak with the gods, or, or at least hear what they had to say. We could see the fairies, we could see the nature spirits and all that sort of thing. You know, see, you know nature is, isn't just the stuff, it's not just like you know, water, it's the portal you know, to this other world. And this was, Barfield is saying this, Steiner saying his own way, Gexer saying his own way, uh, Eric Keller saying his own way. This is because at that time, human, we humans saw the world that way. You know, uh, when, we, when they, they talked about the fairies and the spirits, just, you know, they tried to say, talk about things the best way they could. But it was a way in which the world outside seemed much more living, you know, much more active, figurative. It, it, it had a kind of vital character to it. And um, that's how it was up until about, Gebser says, it gets a little bit more definite on dates. He says about 1225 BC, um, which is roughly around the same time that Julian Jaynes in his uh, very important book, The Origin of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind, which is a bit of a mouthful, but that's around the same time when he says the breakdown of bicameral mind, bicameral just means two chambers. And, you know, we have, we have two brains. I mean, it, it, James was writing in the 70s when it, it, it was just starting to get very popularized, the notion of, of the two brains. But he's saying that in an earlier time at around, you know, uh, this, is, this is even later, but saying Gepsu's date of 1225 or something like that. Um, he's saying before then, we, the, the two brains, they, they weren't separated. He, he's, he, he's saying this is something that happened. But at that time, what, what the human beings, when they heard, they heard voices in their head and they thought they were coming from the gods or the ancestor spirits, but it was actually audio hallucinations coming from their right brain. This is what James is saying. And at a, at a time around 1250, around there, there's apparently quite, quite a few things happened. In, in the sort of Mediterranean world um, that um, caused you know, en enormous catastrophes and disasters and stress. Uh, he, he, he talks about these invasions of the sea peoples and then you have, I guess, the, I think Santorini explodes around them. I'm, I'm not, I may be mixing things up. In any case, things happen that, that somehow force this uh, earlier kind of consciousness to break down and um, human beings no longer heard the voices in, in, in their heads and this kind of thing. And he says, this is the beginning of our kind of consciousness. And the timing is around the same time uh, that Gebser was talking about the shift from the mythic to the mental. And both of them, Jaynes and Gebser, they didn't know each other's work. Uh, they, they point to this myth, the myth of the birth of Athena, who came fully formed from, from the, the brow of Zeus. If you know the story, Prometheus splits Zeus's head open and Athena, the goddess of wisdom, comes fully formed. This is a mythic interpretation of what must have been a terrific, you know, um, uh, wrenching, stressful, you know, uh, experience, this shift from an earlier kind of consciousness to this new one. And Athena is the goddess of wisdom, but she's... You know, she's got the, you know, the, the axe and the shield and all this sort of thing. And this new kind of discursive, logical discursive thought has an aggressive character to it. It wants to get to the point. What does this mean? It, it, it wants to answer the question. The earlier mythic movie is like, you know, let us consult the gods. You know, let us, and, you know, we will get in harmony with things. I want to get there. And this is the beginning of us, more or less. Right. This is the very beginning of this mental rational kind of structure. It gets to a kind of peak around this period known as the Axial Age, which is uh, between 800 and 400 BC. And um, this idea was developed by 
German philosopher named Karl Jaspers. And again, I've, I've, I've spoken about this at, at some talks of the Theosophical Society. The Axial Age was this time when throughout the known world, um, you see the rise of basically the, the kind of beliefs, ideas, teachings that go, go on to form you know, civilizations, both in the East and in the West. You have uh, Taoism, and Confucius, Confucius uh, arising in China, in India. You've got the age of the Buddha uh, happening around there. Uh, in Persian areas, you've got uh, Zoroaster. In uh, the Holy Land, you have the Jewish patriarchs. But in the Greek world, something different takes place. It's a part of this, but these all have sort of ethical, moral, and ethical, spiritual, religious kind of teachings. How, how to live, you know, the, the best way to live. Um, to live in, in, in keeping, you know, with, with God, or whatever the guiding principle is, Tao, you know, whatever it might be. What happens here is something different. This guy here, Thales, he starts to ask, what is this made of? What, what, what what's the stuff? This is made of. I, don't tell me how the gods did it. I don't want the story of why it's here. I don't want the narrative saying, well, one day, whatever, so and so walked by and discovered this stuff. I just want to know just something simple. What is this made of? Whatever it is, a stone. And this is the beginning of rational inquiry. This is the beginning of what, you know, will come to be science um, down the line. And in, in this part of the Mediterranean, you have these philosophers starting to do that. And Thaley says, the Fundamental stuff out of which everything else is made of is water. And Anaximander, uh, an, an I think he says it's air, and Anaxagoras says it's something else, and Heraclitus says it's fire. And, but, you know, they're, they're, they're looking for some fundamental stuff, basically, that things are made of. They, it's, not, it's not a mythic ex explanation. It's not a story telling me why things are the way they are. I just want to know, you know, and so it begins basically questioning. You know, and what um, I mentioned him briefly earlier, the German philosopher Edmund Husserl was what we call theoretical man. You start to come up with theories to explain things. Okay. That reaches its deficient stage. I mentioned earlier that all these structures, they start out with, they start out fulfilling a need. There's, there's a felt change. Something, I mean, you have to remember Thales, he's like, you know, he, he's the first um, absent-minded professor. You know, there's a story where a, a milkmaid uh, watches him. He's going around, you know, wondering about something and he, he, doesn't, uh, he, he, he doesn't see a well and he falls into the well. And she says, oh, well, Thales had his head in the clouds and did not know was, you know, right in front of him. So he's the beginning, he's the first absent-minded professor. And, but he's not absent-minded. He's just not present here. His mind is somewhere else. And it's thinking about other things than what's right in front of him, what the utilitarian kind of thing. He's, he's, he's caught up in um, what it, uh, uh, things that become enigmatic in themselves. You know, it's curiosity, basically. And this is the beginning of, of that. No one really was asking those kind of questions. And again, that's the good. It gets the ball rolling. You know, we start to learn how to think for ourselves and um, the world starts to change. Uh, there's problems associated with that. That's why I'm giving this lecture. That's why Gibson wrote his book. But it's fundamentally, you know, there's a change. And then, you know, we start to, um, you know, uh, adapt to it and all that. But it reaches a point where it's, it's exhausted its possibilities. And this, Gebser pinpoints this in 1336, when this fellow here, Petrarch, does something that no one else did before. He climbed a mountain just in order to see the view. No one had done that before. And at the time, people around him were trying to stop him from doing it. What? You're crazy. Why do you want to go? There's nothing up there. There's monsters, demons. It's windy. It's cold. It's just rocks. Why do you want to do this? And he goes, and it's Mount Venture, which is the windy mountain. And everybody, and, you know, it's easily accessible on the Tour de France or in your Peugeot or whatever these days. But at the time, 1336, no one had ever done that before. Or at least there's no record. There's no record of anyone going out of their way to climb a mountain. Petrarch wrote a famous letter to his confessor about it and all that kind of thing. What Gebser is saying is up on the top of the mountain, suddenly Petrarch can see into the distance and it's a straight line. 
most of the time, your world is pretty much there in front of you, whatever it is, the village, you know, you're in all the time, you know, it's kind of like that. The forest is limited vision. He got up there. He has a new perspective on things. And this is the rise of perspective painting. Earlier in the pre preview, previous time, the Middle Ages and all that, it's tapestry, it's flat surface. We're embedded in the world. Things are large or small depending on their religious significance, not on their actual location. But this is the beginning of, forget about all that, what is it really like out there? What does it really look like you know, to us? And so this is how we, we change and find, and this is the inauguration of the space age in 1336, not in 1957 when Sputnik went up. Sputnik went up because Petrarch got up to Mount Ventur. That was the beginning of it. And then bang, Sputnik's, you know, it's up there. But we're having a breakdown now. It's deficient mode is sped up, sped up and sped up and sped up. And what the mental rational consciousness structure has been doing uh, for the last century or two is taking itself apart. I mentioned Einstein, you know, suddenly the Newtonian world, you know, mechanical world, time and space are absolute. No, they're not. They're relative to the position of an observer in you know, the, the space-time continuum. And they're not even separate things anymore. That, that was strange. But then Heisenberg even freaks out Einstein because it's like, we can't even, we don't, we can't say what these things are doing anymore. It's all probability. Uh, Einstein said, God does not play dice with the universe. Heisenberg and pretty much everyone after him, except for a few holdouts like David Bohm and some of them saying, well, it seems that he does. We can't, we, it's, it isn't, in no way is it anything like the 19th century, you know, billiard, billiard ball, you know, universe where atoms hit each other and we can predict what they're going to happen. It's all waves of probability. Sometimes it's a wave, sometimes it's a particle, sometimes it's a wavicle. They seem to know what they're doing, even though they're not in communication with each other. And there's a variety of other things happening in the scientific world that say that, you know, this picture of this nice, neat um, mental rational universe is breaking down. In the art world, we have Picasso, you know, where, you know, um, Forget about perspective. Now we, we see multidimensionally. The cubists suddenly, they, they saw from all perspectives at the same time. Um, time is breaking down as well in novels like James Joyce Ulysses. It happens in one day. And other novels, uh, Thomas Mann and Hermann Brock and Proust and all of them, it's all about time. Proust is about, he has this taste of a Madeleine at the beginning of the novel and he what was that about? And suddenly he's brought back to his childhood holidays. And then the whole huge novel is about attempts to recapture the past. It's the past recaptured. Time is going back in the other direction. And again, this is just some simple examples of this stuff. And in music, you have atonality with Schoenberg. He says, it doesn't matter what it sounds like. It doesn't matter what the music sounds like. It's, it's this whole new way of kind of understanding the notation. So all of these things are happening. And this is what Gebster calls the eruption of time. I know I'm a little bit over. I'll, I'll, I'll do this very quickly. Time is just, it's breaking into our world. It, it's an eruption. is like an, an interruption. It's like suddenly it's, ah, it's here. And um, it's been like that for a long time. I have this here. I, I didn't even mean to say that. I have this here because this is um, personally just my own little contribution. I was one of the first people um, to have a Walkman when I lived in New York. Uh, in, in 1980, my girlfriend at the time was a model and she came back from Japan where she was on a shoot and she brought back a Walkman and no one else had one. And I was walking around New York with one of those on listening to classical music and people were like, whoa, what is that kind of thing? Mm -hmm. That's the beginning of this because if I wanted to listen to classical music, I had to stay at home unless I'm going to walk around with a you know, ghetto blaster, you know, with baller on. But, you know, I'd have, but now I didn't have to stay at home. I could move around. But it's gone way beyond that now. I mean, even this, when I first wrote about this was old, I don't even know if stuff like TiVo even exists anymore. But the idea that you could, I know when I was growing up, if I wanted to watch something on television, I had to be home at a certain time at a certain place in order to watch the show. And that was it. If you missed it, you missed it. Now you can get it anytime you want, anywhere you want, on your phone, right? <laughs> 
don't, don't leave any moment occupied with the, the enormous amounts of distraction out there. They can be at, your, at, at, a, at your, you know, your fingertips all the time. And so, again, this to me is more evidence for what Gebs was talking about than any kind of mystical kind of thing, because it's seeped into our everyday world. It seeped into the way we live all the time. And now we're in this post everything world where it really does seem like, you know, everything's broken down. I mean, this is uh, in, in the academic world, you have Jacques Derrida, uh, the, the sort of the, you know, the doyen of deconstructionism, which is basically literally deconstructing the Western, you know, intellectual tradition, just taking it apart, taking it apart, gleefully taking it apart. Uh, uh, Baudrillard here, the rise of postmodernism, you know, it's the, the postmodern world where the end of the narratives, it's the end of the grand narratives. Nobody, nobody believes in the grand narratives anymore, whether it's progress or, you know, whatever it is, liberation or freedom, all these things are suspect. And you, you have some people who can learn how to take advantage of the confusion of the time. And they step in as a strong figure in order to give some kind of guidance, but also the promise of a return to a golden age. You know, America in the 50s, you know, leave it to Beaver or whatever, that, that, that kind of time. Um, and, you know, and what do we have? We have the outbreak of the, the unconscious, the American id in the capital at the end of this man's term. So everything erupted then. Um, I, I think it might be a good thing. I think that might have been, even though it was one of the weirdest things ever, it might have been a good thing because it might have popped the boil at the time. So this leaves us to what Gebser, and this is the last one, Gebser um, pauses as what, what's the punchline of all this? And this is what he calls the integral structure of consciousness. Now, I, I have this up here uh, with the left and right brain because I mentioned in the book Secret Teachers, so I kind of bring Gebser's ideas together with Ema Gilchrist's idea about the left and right brain. And in many ways, they do, they do line up. And as McGilchrist says about the need to bring a fusion together between the two brains, well, they, they integrate in the same way that Gebser is talking about this integral structure of consciousness. So it's integrating those things together. It's not getting rid of the left brain, not getting rid of the mental rational in the sense of a plunge into that kind of archaic um, irrationalism that we saw erupt in, in, in the White House uh, earlier this year. But it's, it's a union of the two. And this is something that, you know, in the great tradition, it's always been known, the yin yang and things of that sort. So let me leave it at that.